to start. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. Um, wherever in the world you are, start. I'm Lucas Dijoya. And uh, we're, we're from Delft University of Technology, and I'm speaking to you from the city of Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Um, TU Delft is located in the city of Delft in the Netherlands, and I'd like to welcome uh, you all to our Urban Thinkers campus on a, on a call for a manifesto for the Just City. Um, welcome also to those watching this event on our YouTube channel. We are extremely glad to have you here today and happy that many of you have also decided to participate in our call for the manifesto for the Just City. We are living extraordinary times and we need uh, new and better uh, visions for our cities and communities that are just, inclusive and sustainable. We're a team of students and teachers at TU Delft Global Urban Lab, the TU Delft platform to discuss issues of urbanization in the global south. And the, organ the organizers of this event include Anja van der Vaat, Caroline Newton, Gabriele Caradona, uh, Ganesh Babu, Jonathan Subindran, Natalia Telles, Luz Maria Vergara, Igor Temples Pessoa, Roberto Rocco, and myself. We are also supported by the, uh, by the Delft Global Initiative and the Spatial Justice Network. In, uh, the idea is that by organizing and participating in such activities, we extend the mutual learning much beyond the classroom. This event is organized in partnership with the World uh, Urban Campaign, the UN Habitat Platform, in charge of promoting the implementation of the new urban agenda launched in 2016 in Quito, Ecuador. The website of the World Urban Campaign is in the chat box now. There you can find the complete overview of, of all UTCs organized. Urban thinkers, campus are instrumental platforms for stakeholders to get together to make decisions about implementing the new urban agenda. Today, our special guest is Stein Osterlink. Stein is, a, is an associate professor in the urban sociology at the University of Antwerp. But um, before I give the word to Stein, I'd like to give now the word to the two Delft students involved in the organization of this event. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to Manifesto for the Just City from the students of TU Delft. My name is Natalia, and along with the Global Urban Lab team, TU Delft master students Gabriele, Anja, Ganesh, and Jonathan have pushed to make this UTC happen. Two decades ago, Ed Stochon referred to the, the state of affairs in the field of urbanism as both the best and the worst of times to be studying cities. While there is so much that is new and challenging to respond to, there is much less agreement to than ever before on the best way to practically and theoretically make sense of the new urban worlds being created. We believe that this workshop series is an extremely valuable way of connecting with students from around the world, as well as collaborating with people from varied backgrounds and disciplines. The opportunity to exchange ideas and expand our knowledge will be fruitful for all and will provide us the chance to have a better understanding on global issues. The UTC is a unique opportunity to gain knowledge about current matters that are present in cities around the world. What are the causes of both the visible and invisible inequalities in our cities? And more importantly, how can we tackle these as urban practitioners? Furthermore, we are excited to hear ideas and thoughts from our students participating from around the world. In these times of political and societal unrest, it is important to strengthen solidarity amongst us to push forward our agreement, our agendas towards building a more just and egalitarian society. We hope this workshop will be a nice way to promote collaboration across disciplines, but also across universities and break the silos that contain us.
Thank you, guys. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Gabriele Caradonna. I'm a student from uh, uh, the Department of Urbanism at TU Delft. Uh, this is our third uh, UTC. Uh, the first uh, TU Delft UTC was uh, organized in 2017 and uh, it was titled Education for the City We Need. Uh, there we explored how to discuss uh, and teach uh, the UN Habitat and new urban agenda. The link for the result uh, will be in the uh, chat box. The second UTC happened in uh, July of this year and addressed uh, responses of, uh, to the COVID pandemic in cities around the world, uh, such as Minsk, Sao Paulo, Kerala, Santiago, and how to build uh, back better via the new Green Deal. Uh, we are right now um, preparing a report on that event. I would like to give the floor to Caroline to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Gabriele. I am uh, indeed very happy to introduce uh, our speaker for tonight, Stan Oosterling, who is uh, an associate professor in urban sociology at the University of Antwerp. Um, he is also the, ch the chair of the Center for Research on Environment and Social Change and Antwerp Urban Studies Institute. He teaches courses on urban studies, poverty, and social inequality, and his research is concerned with local social innovation and welfare state restructuring, new forms of solidarity and diversity, and urban diversity policies. He is also the academic director of the newly established Anna Arendt Institute. Anna Arendt advocated active citizenship, in which plurality, connection, critical thinking, and open dialogue are central. And uh, this is not only at the heart of the strong de democracy, but it's also an important goal of the, uh, of the Anna Arendt Institute to think about how to make everyone participate and debate in society. So after digging deeper into some current challenges such as housing injustices and the power of urban planning in the, during the last two weeks, tonight we will get a better understanding of the opportunities to find solidarity in life diversity. So Stan, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you and uh, good evening from my side. Um, let me first put up the PowerPoint so Okay, um, you should all be seeing this, I guess. Um, yes. Thank you very much uh, to the people from TU Delft and the Global Urban Lab for in inviting me to uh, to speak on this event. I'm, I'm a bit overwhelmed by the large international presence here. So I will try to um, do justice to the time you, you spent uh, here tonight. And so I've been asked to talk about uh, solidarity in, in diversity. And I have to stress um, that I'm talking from a very specific position. I, I talk on the basis of research, which we carried out in, in Belgium. Uh, I'm currently speaking from the city of Ghent in Belgium. Um, so it's research which we carried out in Belgium. And it's also, I added some research which we did in mainly European cities. So that means I'm talking to, I'm talking about the subject of solidarity and diversity from a mainly Western European perspective, from the challenges that diversity is posing to solidarity in this specific context. So I hope that, that uh, these reflections, which very much are nurtured in this specific context, are also useful from people working in very, very different environments. And I believe that is to be the case because solidarity, I think, is, a, is something that concerns us all. But of course, diversity is something very different in different, different contexts. So let me just uh, uh, start. Uh, I think I have half an hour, so I'll try to keep um, to time. The main challenge that we um, um, that we encountered in this context is that if, if you look at the public debates about diversity in, in, in many countries around the world, but especially in, in Europe, is that you see a very strong uh, rise over the past 10 to 15 years uh, of a neo-assimilationist tendency. And a neo-assimilationist tendency is, is a tendency in which diversity is seen as something that really challenges, even endangers society, and that the only way you could deal with increasing diversity in, in, in cities and, and countries is by reducing at least the visible diversity. And so what we've been trying to do is to try to articulate by looking at practices in cities and specific places in cities, looking at an alternative vision 
on how we might be able to maintain our solidarity in the context of diversity without having to reduce uh, diversity. And so that's the main endeavor that we started from. So in the diversities project, which was a, a project which was coordinated by the late Ronald van Kempen uh, from uh, Utrecht University, uh, we actually studied um, diversity policies, diversity initiatives from the bottom up in 13 cities, mainly European cities, but also involving, I think, Toronto uh, outside of, of Europe. And what we find out, and that's not a tendency that we see in every of these cities, but what we find out is that, in fact, in most national policies, but also to some extent in urban policies, one sees a, a, a retreat from the multicultural approach, an approach which at least values diversity, which, which, in, which sees diversity as something that needs to be embraced, to uh, an approach which actually returns to an assimilationist agenda. And of course, assimilationism is, is, a, ter is a term which heavy uh, and dark historical overtones. But in fact, what assimilationism means is that the only way to live, uh, to live and to organize societies is by reducing the diversity which is present there. And we do see in various degrees, in various different ways, a return to an agenda which says we need to downplay diversity, especially visible religious forms of diversity. We need to downplay diversity to make living together in national states, but also to some extent in urban societies possible. At the same time, when we look in detail at these cities and at what citizens, what different civil society organizations do in this context, we also see a variety of initiatives of governance arrangements that try to promote diversity. So we don't see this clear tendency towards assimilationism, which is quite clear on many national policy agendas in, 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 in established welfare states. We, we don't see the same thing happening to the same extent on the urban level. Quite to the contrary, we see a variety of approaches, some of which are clearly following an assimilationist agenda, but others who are clearly focusing on anti-racist agenda, an intersectional agenda, a, decolon a decolonizing agenda, a more traditional multicultural approach. So on the local level, one sees a diversity of initiatives, which mostly reflect a more positive approach to diversity. And is this um, tension, contradiction between a clear return to an assimilationist agenda on the national level and a much bigger diversity of arrangements, of governance arrangements around diversity on the local urban level that made us think that perhaps by looking closer at what's happening in, in cities, what's, what we see in, in many of these European cities, perhaps there is a more, more positive approach to diversity and to the possibility of solidarity and diversity, which we can actually identify and try to articulate. So we're trying to articulate in this project, which involved not just me, but a lot of different researchers at different universities in, in, in Belgium. Um, we looked at alternatives to near assimilationism. And the basic question which we, which we put forward is, is it possible to organize solidarity in diversity? And our starting point is, is a concern, which is I think widely documented in the literature. One only has to uh, consult uh, people like Robert Putnam, for example, and his social capital approach, uh, the work of Ruth Koopmans and others that actually show a concern that formal and informal mechanisms of solidarity in established welfare state, and then I highlight that we're thinking from an established welfare state perspective here. So the concern that the formal and informal mechanisms of solidarity are actually challenged by the increasing ethnic and cultural diversities in many societies. Now, I'm not going to problematize the word diversity here, not because that is not useful, it clearly is, and we clearly have seen over the past decades, many critical perspectives on what diversity is and when diversity becomes something that challenges society. I mean, there's a decolonial perspective, there is a, an intersectional perspective, an anti-racist perspective and so on. But I'm not going to, I'm going to bracket this literature here by saying that actually in general, regardless of how diversity is conceived, in fact, formal and informal mechanisms of solidarity seems to suffer from increasing ethnic and cultural diversity. Solidarity is a difficult term. It's a term which is used over and over again, and, and we all think that we think what it means. Uh, but in fact, if you dig a little deeper, it is not an easy concept to, 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 def to define and to operationalize. When we discuss solidarity here, or when I use the term solidarity here, I, I refer to the phenomenon of the willingness of people to share resources with each other. So the willingness to share time, money, space, whatever 
people have as a resource to share that with one another. So solidarity is about sharing and redistributing of resources. Now, the reason why people want to do so is because they feel they share something. They may share the group to which they feel they belong. So they may have a, a kind of group loyalty, but they may also share a fate or feel that they share a kind of future with each other. So the sharing of resources, the redistribution of resources is always done on the basis of the idea that people feel that they have something in common, something that they share. And of course, there are lots of disagreements about what exactly it is that they share. So our aim here is to, to, to identify new forms of solidarity, which go well together with ethnic and culture diversity. So forms of solidarity, which are not challenged by ethnic and culture diversity. And we feel that in order to do so, these forms of solidarity need, need to be innovative. They need to have something new because the traditional established forms of solidarity do not seem to go well together with the increasing ethnic and culture diversity in our societies. And it's a point I'm going to detail, I'm going to support and elaborate in the next, um, next few minutes. And we're very much inspired by a quote of Sigmund Bowman here, who at one point uh, wrote not so long ago, uh, that in fact, in multiple ways, and he expresses it very beautifully, he says in multiple ways, the word solidarity is patiently looking for flesh, which it could become. And it won't stop seeking eagerly and passionately until it succeeds. So basically, he's, he's trying to explain here that solidarity is, is as a concept is, 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 is as relevant to society as it has ever been, but it lacks a bit of flesh. Society has been changing and solidarity has, been, has to be taught anew. And that's exactly the kind of challenge that we undertook in a research project, which was called DM, and hence the logo at the bottom of, 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 the, of the screen. Now, this is our attempt to kind of summarize um, some a lot of classical work in sociology on the notion of solidarity. So I'm not going to explain this whole um, table here, but basically what I want to say that in, in, in sociology, which I think is the, is the science of solidarity, solidarity is the core term which has been theorized by sociology. Sociologists really think about what makes society possible. And their basic answer is what makes society possible is solidarity, is the sharing and redistribution of resources with each other on the basis of the fact that we have something in common. And if you look at the classical authors in the field of sociology, basically there are at least four different terms, four different sources of solidarity which have been identified. And they have been identified in the late 19th, early 20th century. The first source of solidarity is an awareness of interdependence. The idea here is that because we live in complex societies in which we have a large division of labor, we all do different things during the day uh, in order to uh, earn a living. And the fact that we are aware that we need each other, we need to be able to put our children in uh, at school, so we need teachers. We need to have bakers that bake bread, otherwise we have to bake it ourselves. We have to be have people who teach students. So we have to have people building roads. So we have an elaborate division of labor in our society. That's typical for modern capitalist societies. And that the fact that we are aware that we need each other in order to, main to, to be able to do whatever we want to do, that, that awareness makes us uh, willing to be in solidarity with each other. So we are aware of the collective benefits of the fact that everybody can specialize in whatever he or she feels he or she is doing best. The fact that we are aware of these collective benefits creates a system in which we are able to, uh, to be in solidarity with one another. So this awareness of interdependence is one source of solidarity. Another source of solidarity are shared norms and values. The idea that we are all integrated in moral terms in a society, mostly a nation state. And the idea, whether that's right or wrong, that's another matter, but at least the imagination that we live in that society, that we are belonging to that specific nation state, that we are morally integrated in that group, and that with this group, at least we have the perception that we share norms and values, that we have a similar outlook on life, that we have a shared history, through which these norms and values were nurtured, and that this gives us an outlook on the present and the future, that in itself is, of course, a very powerful uh, driver of uh, solidarity. And it's also this form of solidarity, which is very much the driver and the basic framework on which assimilation, uh, the assimilation perspective is based. 
Yet another form of solidarity is not a true struggle. Having a shared enemy, having shared interests, and somebody who threatens these interests and mobilize to get your way, to get uh, to get uh, uh, to win the struggle, that of course is also a very uh, powerful way of mobilizing solidarity. Of course, if you have a shared enemy, it means that solidarity does not extend to that enemy. It means that somebody or some group is always excluded from that, that it's, it's, it's a more exclusionary form of solidarity, but it's a very powerful motor of nurturing solidarity in societies. One can only think about the labor class movement or a movement for racial justice and so on. These are movements that are nurturing strong forms of solidarity by singling out a shared enemy. And a fourth form of solidarity, which was more popular in, in US urban sociology is the, is, and it's also much more on the micro level than the other forms, which are more macro level forms of solidarity, is encounter. And the idea here was, and it's the idea of the classical uh, urban sociology of the Chicago school, is that in fact, by having informal social interaction with strangers in cities, small and informal social interaction, that also nurtures some forms of solidarity something that in the current literature is often called conviviality. The idea that we know how to live with strangers in public space, we know how to deal with others in public transport, in public space, in, 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 in the uh, common areas of apartment blocks and so on. So these small and lo local interactions with strangers, which never go really deep, that is of course also a source of a more light form of solidarity. Now, these four forms of solidarity are as relevant, we believe, as ever in nurturing solidarity. However, the spatial and temporal framework in which they have been used to nurture solidarity, that is something we have to rethink. In order to understand this point, we have to have a, 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 small, uh, a small historical uh, overview. And that historical overview is, of course, very much informed by, by our European positionality in, in this whole debate. In fact, what has, what has happened in Europe from the late 19th century, from the late uh, last decades of the 19th century onwards, up until the, um, let's say, 1970s, 1980s, is we have organized solidarity. We have institutionalized solidarity in welfare state institutions to a level which is unprecedented. So we have levels of redistribution in some established welfare states, which are close to one third of GDP, which is without historical precedent. So in fact, these or societies have very strong forms of solidarity. Of course, redistribution is not always from the rich to the poor. Often it is, but not always. But at least the levels of this redistribution and the way it is, has been institutionalized in established welfare state is without historical precedent. And our understanding, the way we have conceived and developed solidarity is very much informed by this history of the welfare state. Now the history of the welfare state, and that's a crucial point, we cannot understand the history of the welfare state and the way it has been trying to organize solidarity without looking at nation state formation. And in fact, nation state formation, the creation of the idea that you belong to a, a rather homogeneous ethnic and cultural group who has the right to have its own state, that idea, the idea of nation state formation and the idea of welfare state development is completely tied up at least in the European context. And so what has happened is, is that small initiatives of sharing resources or redistributing resources, which began to pop up in the high days of industrial capitalism, in cities, in neighborhoods, in all kinds of locations, these small forms of sharing resources, of protecting people against illness, of, of helping people who are unemployed, or helping, helping people who, um, uh, who are too old to work and so on, all these small initiatives have over the course of the 20th century been gradually centralized and they have been effectively nationalized. And with nationalized, I mean, they have been organized on the national level. So all these local forms of solidarity in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, which erupted, which emerged as a response to the uh, destructive market forces that were unleashed by industrial capitalism have effectively centralized and nationalized in established welfare states. And they have also been secularized because many of them were of a Christian origin and they have been brocketized. So we've seen a gradual centralization and a nationalization of solidarity. And so what one sees is a social insurance system, which is effectively the, the application of the idea of interdependence, 
people contribute when they are at work and they can uh, fall back on that solidarity whenever they are out of work because they are too ill to work or too old to work or they're too young to work, then they can draw on benefits from that social insurance system. So it's a way of pooling risks. It's a way of organizing interdependency uh, in our society. So you see the inter interdependency at work here as a source of solidarity. At the same time, the welfare state is also the result of a social struggle. A social struggle that has been waged by trade unions, mainly organized at the national level, but certainly also a struggle on the geopolitical front. It's a struggle against communism. If it wasn't for the danger of communism, we probably wouldn't have had that much welfare state in the Western part of the world. So there's also a struggle here, which was a very powerful source of solidarity. And importantly, and that's important for our argument here, the development of the welfare state was also fueled by nation state formation, by the idea that we were living, the perception that we were living in culture homogeneous, or, uh, in culture homogeneous countries in which nation and state fell together in one organizational entity. And that in fact, the reason why we were in solidarity with one another is not because of struggle and interdependence only, but also because we shared norms and values nurtured through a shared history and leading, leading to a sort of shared consciousness of what it was that was our past and what it was that we were de doing in the present and how we looked at the future. So these na national welfare states, the fact that we embedded solidarity in national welfare state, in territorialized nation state, is in fact predicated on the idea of culture homogenization. And this sounds evident. It's always been like that, but in fact, the movement that fought for the establishment of social rights, that fought for the uh, establishment of welfare state, in fact, was in its origins, an internationalist movement. The socialist movement, the labor class movement, in its origins was an internationalist movement. And so something, somewhere along the line, this has been embedded in national welfare states. Though there's a lot of historical writings on that, I'm not gonna go, go into too much detail here because that would take too much time. But that's really important to understand because what it basically means is that the way we have been, we the way we have been imagining, the way we have been organizing, the way we have been institutionalizing solidarity has, because of the specific history of nation state formation, welfare state development, is embedded, is, is, has led us to embed solidarity in the intergenerational continuity of supposedly culture homogeneous population nations whose living together is very much contained within clearly demarcated territorial boundaries of the nation state. So the idea is that people live from generation to generation in the same country, clearly demarcated by territorial boundaries in which there is not that much migration, mobility and so on, and which bounds people's life together in, in people that at least think that they have culturally a lot in common. However, and that's how we come to the urban level, migration and increasing ethnic and culture diversity in many countries, not just in Europe, not just in Western countries, but around the world have been undermining this very idea of the nation state. The nation state is in terms of, in terms of space, dependent on spatial boundedness. You need to have boundaries around the nation state. If you don't have these boundaries, it's hard to maintain the idea that you share a fate with all Belgians or Germans or Kenyans or whatever, you need to have some kind of boundedness to have the idea that you are a nation, a group of people that live together. These boundaries are necessary for that. And of course, that's exactly the spatial condition for solidarity, which is exactly undermined by increasing migration, by the increasing penetration and mobility across boundaries. In temporal terms, the nation state is very much built on historical continuity. The fact that people live from generation to generation in the same country and therefore have nurtured a very shared perspective on life. Of course, this is not always the case. Talking from Belgium, which is a failed nation state, this historical continuity has always been disputed. But that doesn't matter that much because the idea is that we, the perception is that this historical continuity is there and that this is a very important source of what brings us together as a nation. And so this historical continuity and the spatial boundaries of the nation state, which very much are spatial and temporal conditions under which we can organize solidarity in welfare states, this is crucially challenged by ethnic and cultural diversity. 
which basically means that the source of solidarity are interrupted, or at least cannot function in the same way as they did before. Because the intergenerational transfer of culture frameworks is interrupted. New people are coming in. They bring their own culture frameworks. New hybrids of culture frameworks emerge. Discussions emerge about what exactly, uh, uh, should, how, should, how exactly should we uh, see um, important historical events. Talking from Belgium, for example, um, we have a lot in common, with, of course, with people from uh, Congo. But we have experienced that history in very different terms. And what we're doing right now, in terms of the, the debate about decolonization, is a painful recognition of the fact that we have a shared history, but we didn't experience that history in the same way. And we have to come to terms with what it is that we did in that history, although most people that are now living, of course, have, have not been involved in any direct way. So this intergenerational transfer of culture framework is no longer a source of solidarity. In fact, it has become a source of division. It divides societies. It creates painful debates, uh, difficult debates, difficult struggles, and so on. So this intergenerational continuity is no longer there, and in fact has become a source of division rather than solidarity. The interdependence is also not working properly as a source of solidarity, because in many countries we see an overrepresentation of ethnic and cultural minorities in, of course, in, in, in for example, the unemployment statistics. So you can think about a lot of reasons for that. And so I am not putting the blame on any group here. But this awareness, the awareness of that this is the case, actually leads many people to say, well, in fact, the solidarity is not working properly because the interdependence is not there. If people are in, in unemployment, they're actually not really contributing to uh, the social security system. So how can there be interdependence? So this overrepresentation, the difficulties many countries experience in integrating uh, newcomers in their labor market, in their in their employment system, actually leads to interdependence uh, weakening as a source of solidarity. And the same is true for struggle. And this is sometimes referred to as a progressive dilemma in social struggle, for example, by people like Nancy Fraser, because in fact, the struggle in the late 19th century, early 20th century looked a little bit easier. It was mainly a source of economic, it was mainly a struggle for economic redistribution. Of course, this is a this is a huge simplification because in fact, the reason why this, this struggle looked so simple, at least from, from a distance is because we because there was an active repression of the, all kind of uh, identities, gender identities, racial identities, and so on. But at least the struggle looked a bit easier at these times today, it's not just about economic redistribution, it's also about cultural rec recognition and political representation, which means that the struggle has also become more difficult as a sort of solidarity because we also have internal debates about what is it that is important, economic redistribution, cultural recognition, how much cultural recognition, how does that how does it relate to economic redistribution? So again, um, economic redistribution has become, uh, of struggle has become a more difficult source of solidarity. So what do we do in this context? And I'm slowly moving towards the urban level, the urban scale. In fact, culture assimilation, although it is tried over and over again by all kinds of nation states and also by some um, urban governments, it's not going to work. And if it's going to work, it's going to be hugely exclusionary because many cities have become minority majority cities. In fact, there is no culture majority, at least not in demographic terms. In terms of political power, there often still is a culture majority, but at least in demographic terms, there is no clear majority, culture majority in many cities. They have become a city of minorities. So any attempt to impose a majority culture will exclude large segments of the population. So that's not a really, that's not really a direction we want to take. Robert Putnam has been proposing a more inclusive trajectory. He says, and he points out the history of the United States, which I think he, he, he says, well, in fact, what we have been doing in the United States is we created a novel one out of a diverse many. Out of all this migrant community who came to the US in the many preceding centuries, out of all these many, we have constructed a novel one. And we can do this again, he says, we can create more encompassing national identities. Of course, that leaves out the fact that this history of creating a novel one has been quite a, a repressive one. I mean, at least the original population of the United States has not been properly integrated in that, or at least not in, on equal terms. 
But again, you could see on the long term how this could work. We would have long debates with each other about what exactly it is that we share, and we could create a novel one out of a diverse many population that find themselves in a specific territory. But that again, that is predicated on the idea of reconstructing historical continuity. Let's try to have, let's try to create a common history again. And let's do this through repeated social interaction across ethnic and cultural lines. And perhaps it could work on the long term. You could see that maybe that could work on the long term and maybe in a more inclusive way than the United States has done uh, up until now, because the Black Lives Matter movement, of course, shows that this history was maybe not as successful as Putnam suggests here. But you could see how could this could be working on the long term. However, what are we to do as urban practitioners, as urban scholars today in the here and now? We can't really wake, we can't really uh, wait for another couple of, 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 of generations to end up there. We need to be able to interfere in the here and now. And that's where we have been trying to articulate. Uh, so we did research in a lot of uh, places in cities. And we were trying to see how do they try to create solidarities on these local, in these local urban places? How are they able to create solidarities in diversity? And in fact, it all comes down to reflection about what you share. We cannot share history because our history divides us very often because we don't really share that history. And we really don't share culture frameworks also. At least we cannot assume that we, sh that we share this. We need to talk about this. And these debates and these, these conversations will take a long time and will often be painful discussions. And so we need to find something else that we share, something that is a lower, that is, that is lower threshold, that doesn't require uh, the same thing, the same shared history, the same culture frameworks. And we've been using, and this is just, I mean, there's a whole literature around that. We used many different literatures to come up to, with this answer to articulate what we saw in practice. So we used literature on citizenship as a practice here. We also used literature on relational urban places from people like Dorian Massey and Ash. I mean, I'm not going, going to go into detail here because that would take us too long. Um, but in fact, what we saw in many of these cities actually dovetailed with what we saw in the literature. And that is that in fact, what we share are places and practices. In the here and now, when people in cities are able to nurture solidarity and diversity, what they shared was not a shared history, not necessarily shared culture frameworks, but it was that they shared a particular place. Often not of their choosing, very often they wouldn't want to be there if they had a choice, but they found themselves there. They found themselves there on the shared factory floor, in the same office block, in the same neighborhood, in the same leisure place, in, in the same housing area. They just found themselves there and they took that as an opportunity to actively share that place, to take joint responsibility for that place and do things together. Not necessarily having long debates about whether uh, the Islam is compatible with the enlightenment values and these kind of things, but just doing things together, just sharing practices, engaging in joint practices. And that's what we mean with, if you want to create solidarity and diversity and you want to do it in the here and now, what we share, and, and it, this is very much assumes that solidarity requires that you share something. And what you share here is a place, not always of your own choosing, but you share that place and you take joint responsibility for that place and you engage in practices. And what you share is what you do in practice. Now, this is an abstract argument and I'm, I'm, um, I hope I didn't lose too many of you by elaborating uh, on these um, historical and abstract arguments. And what I want to do for the remainder of the time and if I'm not mistaken, and somebody has to stop me if I'm taking too much time, but as, as far as I can see, I have another 10 minutes. And what I want to do in these 10 minutes is, is give you a couple of examples of how uh, that works and how, that, how, we, how we did see this working. What you see on the screen is a youth movement. A youth movement is, is youth associations are very popular in many countries. And basically what youth movements do is very easy. You have young people, around the age of 17, 18, 19, 20. And they organize in their spare time as volunteers, they organize activities for younger kids. Every week on a Saturday, a couple of hours, maybe on a Sunday. And they form a group together. They do nice activities together. They engage in plays. Uh, they go on summer camp. They go on, on hikes with each other. And in fact, that's, it's a very powerful model of solidarity. Because what these people are doing, and there are hundreds, and in any country, there are many, many people doing so, is they share time, they share energy, and they commit themselves to doing these activities. They commit their time, 
as young people to give other people, other kids a good time. So it's an immensely powerful form of solidarity in many societies. So you could think, well, what could be more easy than do this with a diverse group? A youth movement, what could be the threshold? A youth movement, it's just people playing together. What could be difficult about sharing that, uh, this energy and this time with each other? Well, in fact, many youth movements are not that successful in integrating diversity, in integrating children from a migrant background in their associations, in their daily life. And so we wondered how come, how come it is so difficult for youth movements to integrate diversity? It looks low threshold, it's leisure time activities, there's not much asked from people. Well, in fact, it was difficult. And the reason why it's difficult is because it is actually based on the same source of solidarity as it is in the nation state. Because how these things happen is that this, these youngsters who commit themselves often do so because they have been to the youth movement themselves as children. And the reason they went to the youth movement as children is because their parents went there too. And their parents explained to them what people in youth movements do and why it's nice to have that. And why you're expected then if you become older to also engage and spend some volunteer time to organize activities for children. So it's a model of organizing solidarity, which is very much based on historical continuity. It's kids from families who from generation to generation actually are in the youth movement and organize activities as young adults later on. And in fact, by, by doing, by organizing these activities, they are supported by solidarity from the community. When they go on a summer camp, they can always talk to local shops, to local entrepreneurs, whether they can uh, get some food for a low price, when they get some uh, material to, 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 to organize place and so on. So they, get, they can always fall back on solidarity of the community. And many entrepreneurs and shopkeepers know youth movements. They may have been involved in, in youth movement themselves. And so they're very happy to share these uh, resources with these children. Parents are also happy to, for example, um, for free um, uh, drive children around, uh, do small maintenance work in, 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 the, in the buildings in which these youth, young people uh, uh, congregate and so on. So it's a, it's a model that really can rely on all the solidarity from the community. And that became visible, or that becomes visible in many big cities. So we actually did research in Molenbeek, and Molenbeek is, is, a, is a disadvantaged and multicultural neighborhood in the city of Brussels. Um, in this neighborhood, there used to be quite a lot of youth associations, and many of them have disappeared. And they disappeared because many of the children and the people living in that neighborhood were not familiar with that tradition. And the people, the youngsters that actually are familiar, actually moved out of the neighborhood because of suburbanization. And so this, this very traditional model of solidarity actually disappeared from the neighborhood. And so this particular youth movement, which is called Hero, it's a Christian youth movement. What they actually did was um, say, okay, we want to be active in, um, we want to be active uh, in this neighborhood again. So how can we actually build, rebuild that model? And so they actually made a, 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 a course, a one-year course in which they involved um, each year a couple of girls from the neighborhood, which they recruited personally, girls from around 17 to 18 years old, mainly with a migrant background. A lot of them uh, had a Moroccan background because this is a, a large uh, migrant population in that particular neighborhood. And they actually trained them to become uh, young volunteers to organize activities. And the idea was then they would spread them around uh, in the city uh, and, and set up a local chairs. In fact, it didn't work as planned because what happened is that these young girls, while they've been uh, trained, they actually started questioning the youth model and saying, why can we, have a, can we have a veal as part of the uniform? Is that possible? What about uh, certain plays that we do? Should it be on a Sunday afternoon because some migrant children may go to the mosque, for example, uh, on a Sunday afternoon. What kind of games do we play? All kind of activities which were traditional for uh, the hero, which they were trying to question and say, well, maybe this is not necessary. Maybe we can do other activities. And how much can we expand and can we um, this youth model? If we do organize other activities, is it still a youth uh, movement? Is it still the hero as it was today? Now, the most controversial issue here was something we didn't expect. 
because when these young uh, girls who were um, then ready to set up a chapter said, well, in fact, what we need to make this work is we need professional support. Because in Molenbeek, there are lots of social problems. And so the youngsters that we entertain in the weekend, they often come with social problems. Some of them are traumatized by war experiences or living in difficult circumstances, have a lot of stress, have behavior problems, do not have enough money to buy the uniform to go on summer camp and so on. And that is just too much for volunteers. So we need professional support to make this model working. And so they brought this to the national chapter and discussed with other young people who were involved as volunteers in this youth movement. And this created a large outrage. And many of the other young people were really angry and said, no, we can't change the model here because our model is based on, we are chill, we, are, we as youngsters, we do that as volunteers for children. And it's a, it's a thing for youngsters. It's not something we want to have adult people involved, especially not paid adults, professionals. We want to keep them away. That's not what we want. And so the most controversial thing to change this model was really about what is the position of professionals in youth work. And this youth movement said, we are a volunteer thing. We don't want to have paid adults involved. And so what I'm trying to tell here is that um, it's a long, long story. So I, um, I will not explain it to, to the full detail. But what I'm trying to explain here is that, in fact, they were pretty successful in recreating the youth association in Molenbeek. But before they could do so, they had to renegotiate what it was that they were engaging in. And they could do so because they did it on the, on the, on the, on, in a specific neighborhood, which they knew well, and which they thought, let's, let's, let's see how we can organize a youth activity here in this specific neighborhood with the children that are here. And let's not take history as assumed. Let's see how we can change the model to adapt it to what we need today. So that's just one example of how you can nurture solidarity in diversity. And maybe I just give one, ex one other example before I um, finish here. Um, let me see, I had four examples, but I will only do two. This is another example. This is uh, a picture from a school in Leuven, which is a suburban community around Brussels. Um, and the idea here was this is a school which is close to the university hospital. And the school population here used to be quite established. Um, it was an established population of a lot of children, of people that worked at university, some uh, an advantaged social, socioeconomic background, pretty educated, high culture capital. So this school was really well performing. And many of its pupils went on for a successful educational career, even went to university where it became successful people in life. And then the past 15 years, things started to change. The population of the neighborhood changed there was a lot of inflow of newcomers, especially people for, uh, with an asylum seeking status. And so in five to six, seven years time, the population of the school was completely changed from an advantaged, mainly white middle-class population to a much more diverse uh, school population of pupils, also often with a much weaker socioeconomic background. And initially the school team responded badly to that. They were saying, well, the level at school, the level of performance at school is dropping. We can't reach our standards. The school population is, is too difficult. We can't reach our standards. We're not performing to the same extent. So in fact, what they were doing is they were looking at history and saying, well, we can only do so as a team. We can only do whatever we do if we can maintain the same standards, if we can do as it has been done in the history of that school. And so what happened is, is that the actual solidarity, bonds of solidarity, which you always have in a school between teachers and children, at least in well-performing school, actually eroded. And a growing distance emerged between the students, a bit between the, the, the teachers and the pupils. They didn't recognize themselves anymore in the pupils. They didn't know what these people were. They didn't sort of felt that they, that they belonged together anymore. And there was a lot of nostalgia to a past of when the school was performing well. And this only changed and that's a break in history, which is often necessary to create solidarity and diversity. This only changed when a new school director arrived, which was not from the school itself, who didn't know the school and who said, I have no idea what the school used to be like. I'm just going to try to create a school community here, anew with the people that are here, not with some nostalgia about the past, but with the people that are here, with the pupils that are here and their parents. And so what he did was very simple. He said, we had to reconnect to the neighborhood. We have to reconnect to the school in that neighborhood because that's the place that we have to build together. 
And he did some very simple things to change that. He said, every morning I'm going to be at the school gate as a director and I'm going to see the population of pupils coming into the school. I'm going to make small conversations with the parents. I'm going to meet the diversity in the neighborhood and I'm going to try to reconnect that to better get to know it. And he also connected to local organization. It turned out that a significant part of the pupils of that school would after school go to a volunteering organization who would give them homework classes all by volunteers. And so they made connections with that organization. Um, they would also uh, try to bring in the experience of this diverse group of students in, in, the, in, in, in the classroom. So for example, in the beginning of the class, they would say, okay, everybody can tell a story. And the idea of course is, is that in Belgium education, the kind of education is, very, is, is, is modeled on, on this nation state model. We tell the history, the first world war, the second world war. So when we, the experience that are shared in that school are very much the experiences which are important to that historical nation state. And so they try to break through that by saying, okay, um, we don't share that history anymore. We have to bring in the history of the pupils. So we need to make room in the curriculum so pupils can bring in their histories, which often come from very far removed from that particular place. And by doing so, he was able to turn that school around. He was able to reforge a connection between the teachers and the pupils by taking a joint responsibility for that place, by creating something that they could share, taking joint responsibility for the place of that that school was, and by reconnecting to the neighborhood. And in fact, by doing so, he was able to sort of rebuild solidarity with um, in diversity in that diverse uh, school population. There's a few more examples I could give uh, also about the school, but I see it's 53 past six and I see the chat um, coming alive. Uh, I can't see what is posted on there, but I guess people are already discussing. So I'll, I'll finish here and I, I would be happy to answer questions if that's uh, necessary. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you in, enjoyed this. If you want to read more about this, here are two articles and a book in which we uh, develop these perspectives further. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Caroline, would you like to start yeah. the discussion? Sure. Thank you very much, Stan. I think it was uh, very interesting, um, giving us a lot of material to think about. And indeed, the chat has been starting to uh, explode a bit with a, a lot of questions. So um, I think that we should go to the questions and try to uh, see if we can answer um, as much as possible. Um, Roberto, do you have a kind of an overview of what was posted? Uh, I will try to, to condense a few of the questions. Okay. Um, uh, a few people were asking about what ideals, uh, uh, like uh, what, what ideals animate a state to create uh, institutionalized solidarity. Are we looking at this? Um, uh, uh, French Enlightenment ideals, and uh, how can we translate that to other countries that have other ideals, like the United States, for example, that is so uh, so much uh, fixed on uh, individuality and freedom. Mm -hmm. So that was. That's a it's a real large question. I I don't think a state is. Uh, uh, I don't think a state is primarily animated by IDs. I think we have a welfare state because people have just refused to put up with some of the conditions in which they were living and just, just forged the movement, a labor class movement, which then um, acquired enough power to force redistribution on the rich segment of the population. And that's, that's of course, animates, uh, ideas of solidarity and inequality that are animating that, but there's also a very material history of that. There's also the history of the labor market, which creates interdependence. So I don't think it's just ideas that animate uh, a welfare state. It's also material forces. And it's the combination of that. And I think what we're starting to recognize right now, and in the field of welfare studies, this is not really recognized, but I think it's, it's about time we recognize that, is that is most national welfare state in Europe are racial states. They are racial states in the sense that they are built on a specific idea of what is the ethnic and cultural community behind that. And the high levels of solidarity in the welfare state are at least partially made possible by the ID, for the very strong ID that we are actually uh, sharing with people who are culturally like us. And that's exactly why migration is challenging the welfare state so much because we, we start to recognize that in fact, this, this, this 
homogeneous community, which probably was never so homogeneous as we perceived, in fact, is not homogeneous anymore. So we don't have this cultural homogeneity anymore. And the basic fundamental question that we find so difficult to ask, because I, I, I stress that these states in historical uh, perspective are very high, have had very high levels of solidarity. So the question is, why can we not extend that to everybody who's on the territory? And the reason why we cannot extend that to everybody who's on the territory is because we are a racial state, because the Belgian welfare state is a state which is based on a white ethnic and culture community. And it finds it very hard to imagine to be in solidarity with people having a different ethnic and culture background. And so think... the idea of solidarity and equality, these are ideas which animate the welfare state, but they're clearly up for some revision. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say. I, I think that brings us to a next question is that people were talking about how to extend solidarity to refugees and immigrants without, who don't have rights when they come to mm. the nation state. Yeah. Um, the basic idea in welfare states is that your access to solidarity is based on formal citizenship. You are formally a member of a particular country. It's not easy to acquire this as many refugees um, experience. Um, and so the idea is the only way to get access to the solidarity in institutional terms is by acquiring citizenship. That of course has become um, under high pressure. And so what we see is that in fact, um, there are new forms of solidarity which are emerging, which practice solidarity. And so the solidarity in many countries with refugees and migrants is often practiced. It's not, an, it's not the welfare state with all its means and resources and its instruments. It's often not the welfare state who's most in solidarity with refugees and migrants. It's often ordinary citizens who say, I feel connected to these people. These people are coming here. So I, I, I have a, some kind of duty to be in solidarity with them because I know where they're coming from. They are now here. Um, let's try to make the best out of it. And of course, there are many people who are responding in different ways, in more violent ways, in more repulsive way. But there are also a group of people who actually practice solidarity. And we have this very nice example, a very nice case study of, uh, I think it was published in, in Citizen uh, Journal of Citizenship Studies uh, one or two years ago, about the previous refugee crisis in which a lot of Syrian and African refugees ended up in Brussels. And they were waiting in line with the government office where they could get access to asylum seeking. Um, the government couldn't manage this. So the government of Belgium, with all its power and resources, couldn't manage that. They couldn't provide a bed, food, and a bath to these people, which they are by law required to do. And so a refugee camp came into existence right in the middle of a business district in Brussels North. And the catering was done by four, five, four to five undocumented migrants who actually went to the uh, markets when they closed, gathered all the food that was left and cooked on a mobile kitchen for thousand, up to thousand people a day. They did so for up to one or two months. So that kind of practice solidarity was actually more powerful than a Belgian state, although those people formally were not even allowed to be present in the country. And that's the kind of shift that we're looking for. We're not trying to criticize institutional solidarity. We think it's necessary, but it's often complemented by new forms of solidarity, which are very much place, place and practice based. And we believe there's something to be learned from there in order to extend solidarity to much more diverse groups. Yeah, there is another quite interesting example in Greece with the Greek grandmothers uh, trying to help refugees, right, and uh, and uh, feeling the duty to 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 help them. Uh, this brings me to the next question about. Uh, it's a, quite an interesting question about what is the the most significant scale to practice solidarity. Should it be a a neighborhood thing? Should it be at a very local scale? Why well, I. I... I, when I was a, a PhD student 10 years ago, I was, there, was, there was the high days of the rescaling debate. Um, there was a debate about on what exact scale are we organizing society and so on. And, and, and so the big insight from that debate was that we shouldn't fetishize scale. It's not, it, there's, there's nothing particularly inherently good or desirable at one particular scale. The urban is not necessarily better than the national. So that means we have to have a historical understanding of, of, of what scales, where they are coming from. So I, I'm, and I, I think that solidarity to be effective should be organized at the highest possible scale, at the world scale. I think that would be the best scale to organize it, but we're not there yet, far from, we're actually 
moving backwards, I think, to lower skills. And so the reason why I'm criticizing the way solidarity is organized on the national level is not because I'm against welfare states. I'm very much in favor of that. I think it's an incredibly powerful model that has brought wealth and well-being to many, many people on the territory. But the way of thinking about the national scale is so much intertwined with, with the idea that we are a culture homogeneous community, that in fact, we have to look at other scales for alternative models. And I think there's much to be gained with looking at the urban scale where diversity is highest at the highest level and where you see people in particular places practicing a form of solidarity, which I think accommodates for culture and ethnic diversity much better than what's happening on the national scale. And the fact that I focus on the, on the urban scale doesn't mean it has to stay there. I think it should be expanded across scales, but it's on the urban scale that we see it today. And, and the reason is quite clear because we are in, living in minority majority cities in which the cracks in the national solidarity model are easiest to see. And that's where people are trying to find out new ways, but it hasn't, doesn't have to stay there. So I'm, I'm very much in favor of, of expanding it across scales and organizing it across scales. Um, oh, oh, well, the, the chat, as you can see, is really uh, very alive. Um, Chris, Chris Klinefelter, would you like to read your question? It's quite an interesting question. Uh, sure, um, if I can find it. Okay, <laughs> I was uh, just thinking about uh, solidarity and, and bringing uh, people together through a shared enemy. <clears throat> Excuse me, I, I thought that the pandemic was a situation that might bring us together. Uh, and, and, you know, but although there's been a lot of division over response um, and people focusing on themselves rather than the greater good um, in many countries. So there's been some very great exceptions. I've seen, you know, in Australia where they shut down a whole city state to try to uh, protect people. Uh, but the, this opportunity has been squandered. I know in our country, uh, the US, uh, as the response has been used as a way to, to divide uh, and I was continuing to type here that another great tragedy in, in the U.S. was 9-11, which did bring the U.S. together. Uh, Those you mentioned, it came at the expense of, uh, you know, groups of people, Middle East uh, in particular. Um, and I'd always thought that something like an alien invasion would, would bring us together. Uh, COVID's probably the closest, but uh, that didn't seem to bring the world together like it could. But that has a lot to do with leadership, I think. I think it's also that, I mean, what we very much advocate for, I, I didn't get to the policy recommendations because that's it's maybe too specific for international audience, but what we actually see is that we have these four sources of solidarity, interdependence, having a shared struggle, sharing norms and values, and, and having sort of informal social interaction with strangers in public space. I think these are all very powerful sources of solidarity. And I think what we should be looking for is not just one model, but new combinations of all of them and the willingness to negotiate that, to negotiate what exactly is it that we are dependent on each other? What exactly is it that we share in, ter share in terms of norms and values? What exactly is it that is our enemy? Um, is is COVID-19 our enemy? I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure because it's... Uh, um, so so I think it's, it's, it's in the combination of these sorts of solidarity that it works because what struggle is a very powerful model, but it's also a very exclusionary model. So we've looked at housing struggles, for example, We've looked at squatting struggles. And what you see there is people are up against a shared enemy and, and, and it creates an, an immense strong bonds of solidarity amongst that group. But once, uh, and we had this model, I think in uh, uh, an empty social housing block in Brussels. And what we found out in fact, that once the struggle was won and they were living in these uh, squatted uh, social housing, some, new, some, new, some rooms became empty because people moved out and then newcomers came in. And these newcomers who came into that, uh, squatted building found it very, very hard to integrate in the group. And the reason is, is because if you have a struggle together, you start to share very strong norms and values. And that then becomes a treasure to new people who have to show that they have the same commitment to this struggle. And that's not easy because you weren't there. And so we have really some really examples that are really hard to understand how a progressive squatting movement could be so exclusionary towards newcomers. And exactly because if you, share, if, you, if you share a struggle, you deform some very powerful norms and values, which then can become very exclusionary to newcomers who were not part of that struggle and who are in fact trying to survive in, 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 in a city with high real estate. And so that's why we always 
try to look at these different sources of solidarity and how they combine and how you can open up the newcomers. Um, it's always a combination. It's not, not never just one source of struggle uh, of solidarity. Uh, we have. Can I? Uh, yeah, go on. Sorry, can, can I ask? Uh, related to this and to what you said before about this, uh, the, the, the the urban scale, what what is something that we as planners or uh, spatial practitioners are there some things that we can add to uh, to our practice so that uh, possibilities for solidarity become maybe more uh, accessible. I, I think um, urban planners can create the conditions under which um, people can take shared responsibility. And let me explain that with one example. It's not going to be revolutionary, but we, we, we looked in factories as well. And so we had this one factory, which called, uh, uh, well, it's not really a factory. It's a kind of, it's called Global Mail. And what they do is a post order company in the vicinity of Brussels. And it, they had an immensely different, uh, diverse workforce. So people were coming from all across uh, the globe, uh, not just to work there, but and it's basically, uh, it's low skilled, low paid work. So on the factory floor, there were lots of people with a migration background. And in fact, despite the diversity, there was actually quite a lot of solidarity on that work floor. And people were doing things for each other. They would get each other back when they had to go to the toilet or, or whether uh, they had a bad day. And so people would really look after each other, would share their right, uh, their drive to the factory and so on. So there are a lot of small practices of solidarity with each other in a very diverse workforce. And um, what we found out, in fact, is that this solidarity only extended to the people on the factory floor who were actually collecting the packages, uh, uh, categorizing them and then sending them out. In the same building, there was also a, a white collar workforce, uh, which was also mainly white and highly skilled. Now, they were working in the same factory and they were working in the same building. They were in the same company, so they had the same aim. You know, they were all important to get to make the company successful. But the white collar workforce would never come on the on the on the work floor because there the the entry entrance to the offices was at was at another site. So the entrance to the floor where all the packages were treated was on one side, and then the other side on the other side there was the entrance for uh, the offices, and there was only one door between the offices and and the work floor, and the only one who used it was a director to check on the work floor people. They never met each other. So there was no contact. And so this building is designed to break solidarity between the office workers and the people on the work floor. And the only place where these people got together was the least attractive um, corner in the building. That was the smoking corner. That's the only place where office workers and people at the work floor met. And that was also the only people who knew each other was people who smoked a cigarette together. And so the cigarette became a kind of object of solidarity across classes. So I think what spatial planners can do is organize spaces where people actually are almost forced to meet each other, at least see each other, get into contact. And many buildings and many places are designed to, to avoid that. Um, and more and more. Um, uh, we have time for one or two more questions. And um, unfortunately, I have to select them. Cristóbal, would you like to pose the first question you made about the social classes? Yeah, thank you. My question was uh, very simple. If it's inherently a working class feature as it's originated in situations where material needs are sold collectively, informal job markets, collective cooking, even uh, criminal organizations, uh, other social groups or institutions seems to develop charity, assistentialism, like churches, uh, institutional state uh, repartitions, but not solidarity as there is no horizontal relations and they always bring something to an existing community considered it less excluded or less favored. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure whether I fully got the question, so I'll... No problem. My question is, is solidarity inherently a working class feature? And this is related also to some other uh, uh, comments in line with me saying that mm -hmm. in migrants, in poor people, you see more solidarity than in middle class or rich people. That's because they don't, they don't have the needs. So you create class conscience based on the needs that solidarity uh, and solidarity. 
it directly acts as uh, the yeah. demiser of this culture. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We, maybe we can uh, attach this question to Althea's question about the uh, lessons in solidarity that you can learn from labor unions that have become more, uh, more uh, diverse in membership in the United States, for example. Mm. So we are talking about class here. Yeah. No, I, 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 of course, um, if, you have, if you have low income, and, and you have a, a weak position on the labor market in a capitalist society, um, you, are, you are bound to have to fall back onto solidarity. Um, if, you if you have a lot of money, you just buy whatever you need to the market and you're less dependent on solidarity with others. And so indeed that, as, as you suggest, people from low income groups are just more dependent on each other uh, because they can't get it to the market. Um, but I don't think that that solidarity is only uh, um, a working class thing. Uh, I and mean, there's a lot of solidarity amongst the very rich as well. Um, <laughs> and I think what we should understand, solidarity is not always positive. And the reason why it's not always positive, solidarity is always based on, there is always an, an, an underlying idea of a community of people that have something in common. Now, the tech companies in the US, in Silicon Valley, no, much, no matter how much they compete, if it is to defend their interests against being paid higher taxes, they will find each other and they will be in solidarity. No matter how much they compete, they'll find each other if it is to resist higher taxation. So there is a lot of solidarities which are actually regressive. In fact, what we see in, in, in countries uh, uh, like, like uh, I mean, the Brexit, the Brexit is a case of solidarity. It, but it's a regressive case. It is saying, keep solidarity to the British, whatever that might mean. Um, the same is true for what's happening in Poland and Hungary. These are very regressive forms of solidarity, but it is solidarity. There's a very strong sense of a community there and the fact that people want to share resources in that community. So not every form of solidarity is a progressive form of solidarity. Um, so in order to have, and, that, and then we come back to the first question about the idea, what ideas animate solidarity, uh, animate the welfare state. It is the combination of solidarity and equality. And that is what makes the welfare state a progressive idea because it combines the idea of solidarity with equality, with the idea that we should, that, that at least the end result should be that we are more equal, uh, at least in, 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 in material chances in life. Um, and so in that sense, um, solidarity is connected to different classes. They can all have their own form of solidarity. And I don't think, and I think that's the powerful thing about the welfare state. In fact, the biggest beneficiaries of the welfare state are the middle class. And I think the difference between the US and the UK and the US and Europe is in Europe, the middle class realizes that and the US they don't. Um, so the strongest support base uh, for the welfare state in, in, in Europe is the middle class. They get access to cheap education, quality education to cheap and quality healthcare to, to all kinds of things which support themselves in life. They would never be middle class if it wasn't for the welfare state. And there is a strong awareness of that. And it also makes them chauvinistic, unfortunately. That's also why they want to, when they often have a tendency to keep it away from newcomers because they feel it, it, it would uh, lessen. Um, um, so in that sense, I think the, in, in many uh, established welfare state, the attack on the welfare state is not an attack which is based on uh, a, full fl a, a flat rejection of solidarity. It is based on the rejection of the extension of solidarity to diverse populations. Um, Sorry, that was a long winding answer. No, no, it was. <laughs> I hope it answers uh, the question. Thank you so much. Uh, I will have to disappoint quite a few people. Maud, uh, Mero, Ganesh, Alejandro, you made a very nice question. Uh, but I will, I will have to disappoint you because we need to conclude. So, on behalf of everybody at TU Delft and everybody who organized this uh, event, I, I would like to thank you very, very much. Stein for your contribution today. I think it was incredibly relevant for the task that uh, they have at hand, that is to write this manifesto for the just city. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, thank you so much. If, if we can all uh, unmute ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, Caroline, uh, you talked to Stein, right? Uh, right after this. Y yes, okay. because uh, for for those who are participating in the workshop uh, of the um, 
of the manifesto, we will have now a five minute, 10 minute uh, break. We are going to be back at 1925 sharp. And we are going to have the rest of the, of the workshop. Um, I'm not going to close the, the, the meeting. The meeting will stay open, but we will have a, a, a comfort break as the British say for 10 minutes. Thank you so much and see you in 10 minutes. Bye bye. Then, Arthur, bedankt. Was uh, ja, fantastisch uh, interessant. Ik ga jou ook nog wel een mail sturen. Ja, oké, okay, dat is goed. Bedankt en uh, veel bedankt. succes. Ik kijk uit naar ja. het manifesto. Ja, wij ook. <laughs> het is fijn om zoveel mensen hier te hebben. Ik was een beetje, toen ik de, de mail van Roberto kreeg van oei oei, van ja. uh, zo'n welvaartsstadverhaal voor. Uh, de hele wereld, maar ik heb het eerder gedaan voor een, voor een niet-Europees publiek, dus ik... Uh, ja. Uh, ja, het was... Oh, uh, I, I, thought super, it was uh, I thought it was uh, uh, global enough, Stein, don't yeah. worry. It yeah. was uh, people... Sorry, Stein, zou ik je iets mogen vragen? Um, ja, tuurlijk. Hoe, hoe, zou je, hoe zou ik je werk terug kunnen vinden of lezen of, of een beetje... Want dit, dit concept van, allee, dit paradox in, in solidariteit is voor mij iets gewoon heel nieuw. Ja, ik... ik uh, de laatste slide is niet zo lang op geweest. Hè. Daar staat een artikel waarin we dat uitgebreid uitwerken en dan, dan een boek. Um, zal ik misschien de slides met Carlin delen? Perfect. Ja. Uh, yeah. yeah. Ik zal die opsturen en dan kan je die, je kan die delen hoor. Dus daar staan geen copyrights op of zo. Dus, uh, um, en, en ik denk dat je daar veel, veel gaat terugvinden. We hebben, ook, we hebben heel veel materiaal in het Nederlands natuurlijk, maar dat is misschien minder toegankelijk. Um, er is ook een website, ik ga dat misschien in de, in de chatfunctie nog zetten. Ja. Waar dat, althans voor de mensen die Nederlands lezen. Ja, hartelijk bedankt, uh, Stan. Graag gedaan. Je mag mij altijd contacteren. Uh, no, Christel, we are just asking for more uh, uh, links to the work. So Stan is going to uh, share a, um, uh, a link to a website. And I will send the... Uh, our, ja, yeah, we will share the slides where you have also on the last slide all the, uh, the links yeah. to the papers. Oké, okay. goed. Oké, okay. I shall leave you to this now. Oké, okay, thank you, Stan. Good luck with the exercise and uh, thank you for the invitation. I uh, really enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.